everyone. My name is Doug Sims from NRDC. And on behalf of Green Bank Network, I'd like to welcome everyone here in person and attending online to make some brief announcements. First of all, I'd like to thank Climate Works Foundation for their longstanding support of the Green Bank Network TV, and the JM Kaplan Fund for their generosity in hosting us in this space today. To provide some brief context, context about why this is such an appropriate venue for this event, the JM Kaplan Fund has a deep 75 year history, including commitments of over $48 million to propel efforts concerning civil liberties, human rights, conservation, and enhancement of the built and natural worlds. One of their primary programs focuses on environmental grant making, addressing issues relating to deep seabed protection and climate change more broadly. Thank you to our gracious hosts for the work you do for having us here today. Today's event will have three segments, keynote remarks, a fireside chat, and a Green Bank Network member panel. After each segment, there will be an opportunity for questions from the room and the virtual audience. In the event, someone from the media is attending and has a question, please email them to Jake Thompson, jthompson at nrdc.org. NRDC is a 501c3 organization, public charity that is dedicated to safeguarding the earth. This event is intended to raise awareness and education around the Green Bank model and the climate and economic benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act. NRDC cannot and does not support or oppose any candidate for office. Speakers are reminded to please refrain from any and all mention of the election or the campaign during this event. While the media may be in attendance, only our invitation. The purpose is to provide information about NRDC's mission and our work. Now, I hand it over to Margaret Truly. Margaret's a member of the NRDC Board of Trustees and Chief Executive Officer and Chief Investment Officer at Impact, at Impact Assets, a leading impact investing firm dedicated to changing the trajectory of our planet's future and improving the lives of all people. Impact Assets has more than 2 billion in assets and over 1,700 donor-advised fund accounts. Working with purpose-driven individuals, their wealth managers, family offices, foundations, and corporations. Margaret will provide some framing remarks and welcome our two keynote speakers. Margaret. Good afternoon, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. The passage of the Inflation Protection Act, which will deliver $369 billion in energy, climate, and justice investments, is the most consequential climate action ever taken by the United States. I don't know about you, but I am feeling hopeful for the first time in a long time. This new climate law has the potential to cut U.S. greenhouse gas pollution by 40% below 2005 levels by 2030. This is a major step towards President Biden's pledge to cut climate pollution 50 to 52% by 2030. And it begins to position the US to meet its global obligations on climate change. As we move forward, it will be critical that implementation of the law happens in a way that helps to cut our carbon footprint and confront environmental injustice. We must channel funding in a way that helps to shield the most vulnerable communities from pollution and extreme weather. The new climate law through the Greenhouse Reduction Fund is also a long overdue step towards establishing a national climate fund or a Green Bank. As we will hear today, Green Banks are a proven model, both here in the United States and around the world, proven for spurring new private investment in clean energy, efficient buildings, climate resilient infrastructure, and for building new markets for climate solutions. Green Banks utilize limited public capital to, to mitigate investment risk, build local capacity and jumpstart markets. Whether a green bank is founded with the specific purpose of driving climate investment or created by, as we have seen in other countries, aligning an existing public development bank with climate goals, these mission-driven financial institutions can inspire, or can inspire ambitious climate action. 
We have seen the success and the impact of the model at the city and the state and the national level. And to date, the members of the Green Bank Network have mobilized 50 billion US dollars into green sectors and helped avoid 50 million metric tons of carbon pollution annually. And as we will hear from our speakers today, they can also help advance equity and climate action in underserved communities. In addition to serving as a secretariat for the Green Bank Network, NRDC has also worked for over 10 years with partner coalitions to call for a national climate fund or Green Bank in the United States. At NRDC, we strongly welcome the creation of a new greenhouse reduction, greenhouse gas reduction fund as mandated by the new climate law. The new fund can play a critical role in helping the U.S. tackle climate change while advancing environmental justice and equity. As a part of the impact investing community, I'm encouraged by the opportunity the fund will create to accelerate the flow of capital towards reducing emissions and particularly the assistance it can provide for low income and climate impacted communities. Over half the GHG reduction funds, 27 billion, will be required to explicitly benefit low income and disadvantaged communities, whether by providing capital um, by capacity building grants or emerging or existing green banks, or to other institutions like credit unions, community development financial institutions, and minority deposit institutions, the new fund will play a major role in ensuring disadvantaged communities will benefit from climate actions through cleaner air, low energy bills, and better infrastructure in the places where it matters most, at home in their very communities. At NRDC, we are continuing to work with diverse partners and coalitions to help the success of the new fund in advancing climate action by focusing on three key design principles, flexible adaptive capital with good terms, education and technical assistance, targeted and equitable projects that respond to community priorities. To investors and philanthropists considering climate solutions, this is just what we've needed. Um, and none of this happens without partnership with private capital. Our collective investment will ensure critical bridging and the critical bridging of any gaps in access to transformative capital as we race towards achieving net zero. So on behalf of NRDC, I am thrilled to welcome Representative Debbie Dingwell from Michigan and Senator Ed Markey from Massachusetts yeah. for joining us virtually for today's event. Representative Dingle, Dingle and Senator Markey are two longtime supporters of the U.S. National Green Bank that can leverage public and private funds to invest in clean energy and infrastructure. Both uh, Representative Dingle and Senator Markey were instrumental in making sure that the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund was included in the Inflation Reduction Act. We are thrilled that they can join us today to share their thoughts. I'd like to turn it over now to Representative Dingle, who will provide the first keynote remarks and afterward, we'll hear from Senator Markey. Uh, Representative Dingo, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And I apologize for my uh, background, but I'm in a telephone booth off the House floor where we are currently voting. So it's, um, it's but we're, we're doing a lot of good stuff. Uh, I'm really sorry I cannot be there in person, but I am very grateful to join you all virtually along with my dear friend and colleague, Senator Ed Markey, who I've known for what well, seems like forever, but we're not that old. And he's been the best partner in this fight to establish a national climate bank. This is an effort that everybody's been working on for a long time and has been called many different things. A national climate bank, a national green bank, or as the legislation I introduced in 219 and 2021 called it, a clean energy and a sustainability accelerator. And in case you think it hasn't taken a long time, it was first introduced back in 2009 by somebody who I just happened to love and may have had the same name, last name as I did. So people have been working on this a long time. I'm so optimistic about the provisions that were included in the Inflation Reduction Act to create a greenhouse gas reduction fund that has the potential to cut US greenhouse pollution by as much as 41% below 2005 levels by 2030. The Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund provides $27 billion to establish a nation climate bank, a national climate bank to help finance important carbon emission projects nationwide. 
It will intentionally, intentionally dedicate $8 billion to assistance to low income and disadvantaged communities, a significant step to further our environmental justice goals, which is so important in all of this. This is the single largest investment in clean energy, environmental justice, and climate action in American history. To reach our goal of a fully clean economy, we need an aggressive agenda with comprehensive efforts to spur innovation. Uh, sorry, somebody was sending me something. Uh, innovation towards a net zero clean energy economy. A national climate bank is an important implementation tool that will probably finance and stimulate private investments to clean renewable energy projects, clean transportation, something I care very deeply about while supporting communities that have been most affected by climate change. This is a proven model. It's flourishing around the country. Existing green banks, including Michigan, Michigan states, which was one in my home state of Michigan, have now driven $9 billion of total clean energy investment. This means three private dollars for each green bank dollar. It mobilizes investment directly into the greenhouse gas emissions reduction projects most in need of capital. Projects that are not only uh, environmental opportunities, but incredible economic opportunities too, creating good paying high value jobs and a strong workforce across the country. But we don't have a moment to lose in this fight. Now that we've secured the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund in the Inflation Reduction Act, we must move rapidly to invest maximum funding into a national climate bank that will support the equitable transition, equitable being a very important word, to a clean energy economy and fund a nationwide network of state and local climate banks. By doing so, we are turning the challenge of climate change into an opportunity for prosperity. An effective national climate bank program will build generational climate friendly wealth in communities that have the least access to clean energy capital and are most at risk from an, uh, environmental harm. It will bring together a comprehensive, diverse and inclusive network of state and local financing entities in the public and nonprofit sectors. They're calling me to vote, I apologize. And it will allow state and local entities, nonprofits and leaders to make their own investments tailored to the needs of their communities with the capital and technical support of the National Climate Bank. I could go on, but I see that my partner in crime, or actually partner in doing a lot of good, has arrived. So uh, I'm going to continue this work. I thank you all, and I'm going to go vote and turn it back to you all so you can hear from the great distinguished senior senator from Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. Um, I know you're busy and really appreciate your time and your comments. Senator, welcome. Oh, great. Um, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, great to be with uh, Congresswoman uh, Dingell. Uh, obviously, uh, this is a very big deal. Uh, so I just really appreciate your inviting me as your keynote speaker for uh, today. Uh, we just have a lot to celebrate uh, with all the hard work in passing the Inflation Reduction Act, but in it, there is a $20 billion climate bank, and we are ready to jumpstart the economic engine of our new clean economy. Uh, back when uh, Henry Waxman and I were putting together the, the Waxman Markey Bill back in 2009, uh, you know, working with Chris Van Hollen, who was my partner over in the Senate uh, at this time, we were able to get it included. Uh, and it's been 13 years uh, waiting for the moment, and it has arrived. You know, sometimes you can be right, but too soon. You got to wait for the correct, timely, historic moment. And now this package has the potential to stop righting the wrongs of environmental justice, 
uh, to cut U.S. greenhouse gas pollution by as much as 41% uh, below 2005 levels by 2030. And the new greenhouse gas reduction fund breaks down into $7 billion for low emission technology grants and financing and $20 billion for climate financing, 40% which must go to disadvantaged communities that have been locked out of green capital for far too long. This fund was modeled off of the National Climate Bank Act, which I co-authored with my great friends, Congresswoman uh, Dingell and uh, Senator Van Hollen. Uh, Alexander Hamilton proposed the Bank of America, the Bank of the United States, and together we're building on his legacy to propose the green banks of the United States, uh, pioneering the next frontier of financing to save the planet and to create jobs. The group in this room has already accomplished tremendous things. You all have helped supercharge the green revolution that is currently underway, armed with more green in your vaults and green at the heart of your mission statements. I know you will only continue to do more. The Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund includes $8 billion to capitalize loans to disadvantaged communities and $12 billion to capitalize other emissions reducing projects around the country. A robustly funded National Climate Bank will rapidly deploy mature technologies while commercializing and scaling new technologies. And the bank will make investments directly into projects that reduce emissions, as well as provide financing to eligible regional, state, and local green banks and technical assistance for the startup of new green banks all across the United States. A national climate bank can expand the reach of green financing and will unleash support for emission reduction projects, either by directly financing projects or by helping to establish new green banks. A national climate bank can partner with state and local green banks and the private sector to move the United States quickly and cost effectively towards a zero emission future. The purpose of the National Climate Bank is to make the United States a world leader in combating the causes and effects of climate change and to maximize greenhouse gas emission reduction per public dollar deployed. With $20 billion in capitalization, we could leverage up to $200 billion in total investments. With $20 billion in capital and an effective National Climate Bank, climate solutions can become a reality. The National Climate Bank can put projects into practice that create jobs and serve low-income, minority, distressed, and rural communities. A National Climate Bank can be responsible for direct lending, co-lending, and credit enhancements to encourage new projects to reduce emissions, including renewable energy generation, energy storage, electric vehicles and infrastructure, climate resiliency measures. A National Climate Bank can use federal dollars to break down barriers to private investment in clean energy and low carbon projects. As you all know, the solutions to our climate challenges are less a matter of insufficient technological capability and more a matter of insufficient capital for technologies. By unlocking private capital, the National Climate Bank will multiply the impact of each federal dollar deployed and provide more investment opportunities. And further, the National Climate Bank will actually help Americans save money on their energy bills. With the right financing, communities with the most at risk can be the ones with the most to gain. The time for action on climate change is now. Let's use this power of private investment to build a climate future that works. This can be an engine for economic growth uh, that becomes the real secret weapon, which is in the Inflation Reduction Act. This is the proposal, uh, which when people look back uh, will be viewed as something that so overperformed in terms of its uh, perform in terms of its ability uh, to unleash uh, uh, capital uh, and to uh, reduce greenhouse gases uh, by doing that, uh, that it will be viewed as the model forever uh, to deal with this issue and probably with other issues as well. So I can't thank all of you 
uh, more. You're on the cutting edge of a revolution, uh, and the, the the bank is going to be central uh, to making sure that revolution works, and it works in ways that right now are unimaginable because it's only going to be limited by people's imagination. Thank you all for what you're doing. Truly, God's work here on Earth. We felt we had a few questions, um, but we don't, we send it. So, um, we're going to move on to our next part of the program. Next, uh, next slide. Well, I'll set you up. No. Um, our next section is really exciting. It's uh, where we see what green banks do in reality in action. It's a very special fireside chat on um, New York Green Bank. We have Gregory Randolph, who's the managing director of New York Green Bank. And Marcelo Ruco, CEO of EchoSafe Incorporated, talk about how they're working together to drive change in New York State. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, Marcelo. Good afternoon. Uh, Thank you for having me. Uh, we have had, uh, we at the New York Green Bank have had the pleasure uh, since uh, 2019 of working with EcoSave and Marcelo uh, in helping to uh, to finance his, his company, expand his company primarily here in New York, but uh, he's, he's achieving it around the country as well. And uh, what we thought we'd do this afternoon is just talk a little bit about how we work together, um, how we structured the big transaction, which uh, has worked very well for both of us. In fact, uh, we have doubled the size of it since, uh, since uh, we entered this little transaction with Marcelo in 2019. And um, hopefully it's useful to other people here in the audience. Marcelo, when you say a little bit about um, the types of projects that you say from Shark is building and mm -hmm. perhaps some of the issues that you were facing with financing with you guys have. Sure. So I set up Eco Save over 20 years ago to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from energy use. Our goal is always to make every building as close to zero carbon as possible in a way that's financially viable for the building. Because I learned very early on that as humans, we're very short sighted and that we only invest in immediate returns. And that, you know, in the early days of EcoSave, I used to go around with a, a book showing uh, you know, uh, environmental damage and, you know, uh, and deforestation and all the things, but nobody cared. <laughs> nobody cared. I had to, you know, learn quickly that I had to show returns on investment and had to show, you know, cash flow positivity and leave my green hat at home and just know that I was doing something good, but don't tell them about that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, we do both deep energy retrofits, as well as green energy generations, uh, energy storage, everything that can possibly reduce carbon emissions and reduce water use. And we have done every single industry. So um, I started this company in Australia over 20 years ago. And um, earlier on, we were more of a traditional LESCO that did government and mash market and, and those kinds of things. And, um, you know, there's a lot of companies catering to that market. And I saw that to make an impact on global emissions, we needed to cater to everybody else, not to the smaller businesses, to the non for profits, to the commercial office, to the hotels, the manufacturing plants, and that kind of you know, market wasn't really being attended to. And um, so we focused on that market. And um, we developed, with the help of PricewaterhouseCoopers, our own version of the energy services agreement uh, in order to be able to offer clients something that was funded where I no longer had to compete against the capital for their core business. And I could offer something that was cash flow positive from day one. Um, and uh, we set up here in the US nine years ago, in 2013, I came over with uh, 10 families that are brought from my Australian EcoSafe business. 
so that we could immediately start a company here in the US. Um, and uh, now we work every way east of the Mississippi. So we have contracts from Florida, you know, all the way to um, uh, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, and uh, our offices here in the US are in uh, Boston, New York City, Philadelphia is the US headquarters. Well, it's a global headquarters for some here. <laughs> uh, and uh, in Washington, D.C. And if you would just tell us a little bit about the nature of the business here in New York, and then uh, perhaps we can talk a little bit about how we structure the financing that you were in these back in 2018. Certainly. So uh, we're going for that commercial non for profit market. That, you know, markets that, um, when we first started uh, you know, putting together and going to market with these eco safe services agreement, you know, our own version of the off energy, energy services agreement, um, you know, we were going to community centers, you know, to retirement homes, to hotels, to commercial offices. And um, that's a very different type of style to a typical ESCO. So that's a style where I had to develop a sales force that could speak the financial language and go uh, directly uh, to the CFOs and uh, a commercial sale rather than uh, you know the mass market that's more engineering based, you know, and selling engineers selling to engineers. So initially, when we started selling to New York, because our head office is in Philadelphia, uh, we were selling from Philadelphia. And as we started to grow, you know, our, our, our people that we were going to for funding in those initial jobs when we first started going out to market uh, were city of Fox. And it was NYSE here in New York, and it was uh, TRF in Philadelphia, and we dealt with many others at uh, city of Fox. And they're wonderful people to deal with, but uh, they're very limited in the capital they can lend. You know, there's only so much uh, in a pool of funds that I can lend to any one uh, borrower. And uh, they're also very geographically restricted. So we found ourselves in a place where we were not big enough to go to the big banks. We don't want to talk to you unless you've got a hundred million dollar facility. But we were too big for the city of Fies that, you know, can't give you more than five or 10 million to any one client. Um, so, uh, as we were moving into New York and, you know, projects in New York are twice the size of projects anywhere else. You know, it's New York City. Um, uh, but even manufacturing plants, you know, Friday, we got a $12 million contract for a manufacturing plant just north of Albany in Glen Falls. And, you know, everything in New York is bigger. Uh, so we needed, we needed that funding. And there was just, other than New York Green Bank, we couldn't find it anywhere. It just didn't exist. And one of the great things, you know, and there are some green banks out there that are also very geographically restricted. Our savior was that the New York Green Bank was able to structure something that gave us, uh, you know, better, uh, a, a better structure, a better deal to sell within New York State, but they still allowed us to borrow for projects outside of New York State. Because the reality is that the more we grew nationwide, the more we would grow in New York. So when we first did the deal with New York Green Bank, we had like one person here in New York City, you know, by the end of this year, we're gonna have 21. So uh, New York Green Bank helped us grow nationwide, but they helped us do a lot more here. You know, we could not have done it without you. Thank you. So the uh, and for the first time in my life, I've actually been asked to speak up. My God, I'm usually sort of shut up. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so you can hear us. So, but, but please let us know if you can hear us back. Um, but uh, the the beauty of Marcelo's business is that these e, these ESAs have monthly payments, but for with a variety of different types of clients, these are primarily uh, private institutions. None of them are are publicly held companies. So it's a, it's a that just a, changed. Oh, good. good. That just good. changed. Good. Okay. Well, we're glad to hear that. <laughs> but uh, the issue is you, you have to do a credit analysis on each one of these potential issues. What we were able to do to help Marcelo grow his business 
was to create a credit box uh, against which um, he could provide contracts that we would we would advance funds against uh, and it, and it in a manner that was from a credit perspective responsible from our standpoint but that provided him with the growth capital uh, that um, that uh, that he needed uh, we're pleased that um, uh, EcoSave came to us uh, I guess two years ago now the upsize the transaction uh, to to 30 million dollars. Uh, so the bottom line here is um, what we've been able to do with with Marcelo's help uh, is to fill a void that is between um, smaller CDFI financing and and the large banks that are out here. The New York Green Bank is not here to to compete against the uh, J.P. Morgan and Bank of America and so on. We are here to provide capital, plug plug holes in the capital structure. That the private market is either not meeting or not meeting on terms that meets the needs of of, uh, of people like Marcelo. Uh, yes, we are focused on growing businesses here in New York and providing jobs for New Yorkers. So with that, uh, we are pleased that uh, you now have uh, the the uh, the size office you have in New York that you do, and uh, we're pleased to be contributing to greenhouse gas reductions in the state of New York. Thank you for helping us do it. So one of the things that was really useful about our facility uh, was that we could go to the market with confidence knowing that we had a facility. That, you know, when we were going through CDFIs, it was one project at the time. You know, it takes us a year to sell it and then we have to go, are we gonna be able to get funding for this? Like, are we gonna go be able to, you know, and you know, we saw a casino, we went to a CDFI and we go, hey, we've got this really great casino contract. And they got, now sorry, we don't do vice industries. Okay, but they're still producing greenhouse gas emissions. You know, that might not be a nice industry, but they're still polluting. We still got to cut the greenhouse gas emissions too. You know, uh, so uh, you know, New York Green Bank gave us uh, a criteria that we agreed upon together, and as long as it met that criteria, we knew we could uh, go to the market and you know, with confidence, not have to worry. It's not enough to sell these contracts. Like, you know, we didn't need the additional complication of also then having to sell it to a financier. And, uh, you know, very recently, uh, thanks to New York Green Spain's help, we were able to grow to a size where a big private equity firm came and took a majority stake in Ecosse and you know, helped us close a $75 million facility with a regular bank. Um, but we would not have been able to do that had New Green, no, New Green Bank not, uh, not have helped us reach this gap, you know, this gap that's just not covered by commercial banks. That is, uh, that is what we're here to do. And what we're, we're trying to do with somebody like Marcelo is also create a structure that could be replicated elsewhere. Um, you know, with, with a transaction of this nature, the other fear you have is that the documentation costs alone you know, can offset can can offset the the uh, the benefit that it that it provides for for somebody like EcoSafe. So I think what we'll be able to do is come up with a mouse trap that is that is relatively simple, is relatively simple to document, and can be replicated uh, to to other issuers, which is what our goal is. Okay. So something that I wanted to add because there is a group of green banks in the room yeah. is that hopefully, you know, uh, you're out there helping other companies like mine, right? and we're all in this room want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And you know, that's really the end game. And um, I wanted to give you a few things of what worked and didn't work. So that when you are out there helping other companies like mine, you can maybe steer them in the right direction. After 20 something years of doing this, there's been a lot of trial and error. So uh, when we are out there with offering clients you know, a business solution that's gonna have either the payback they want, if it's gonna be cash flow positive, sorry, if it's gonna be using their own money or you know, cash flow positivity if they're using that money. And we offer them, they can pay for it cash themselves if they want to, they can, we offer pace lending. We offer a stride out line where it's just, you know, like you do to us, it's a you know, back-to-back -back line where it's uh, on their balance sheet. 
And then we offer the EcoSafe Services Agreement, which is the shared savings model of balance sheet to the cloud. So we're out there, we just want to do a project, save energy and maintain uh, and serve as a project over a long period of time. And 80% of customers choose the off balance sheet funding. Only once in the nine years I've been here in the US has somebody taken out the actual bid, right? On their balance sheet. And about 20% of the client uses their own money or their own cash. Right? Now why, and we've never, even though we've been offering pays, nobody's taking it. Because when they see it against the off balance sheet option, the space is not off balance sheet, okay? We deal with all the big four accounting firms because our clients as auditors have and St. Young, KPMG, PwC, base is not off balance sheet, no matter how they try to dress it up. Um, so there is, you know, what that tells me is that at least this market segment where they're not publicly listed companies, where they're not, you know, this middle market um, really cares about not having to pay and get permission from their banks. And there are many times when clients, you know, tether and they say, oh, yes, you know, I had a retirement community recently that said, oh, yes, we're going to go with your stride out there. We want to improve our net operating income. It's a for-profit uh, retirement community. And after, you know, all the iterations then that are going with the off balance sheet. Uh, our first, you know, one of our, uh, this contract that I was just saying in New York, that we got on Friday, that's a big publicly listed international manufacturing plant with 200 factories around the world. They say, oh, we got our own money. You know, we can get money cheaper. You know, we are, you know, great Moody's rating. You know, we've got all this money floating around much cheaper than what Ecosave can do it for. So, and in the end, they sign an Ecosave services agreement. Okay, they all balance. <laughs> because, if you do a deep retrofit, you can't do a two to three year payback, right? And I, we, you know, our paybacks tend to be really, if I look at it on a cash payback, a five to seven years, most of them, uh, we can turn that cash flow positive from day one with an off balance sheet services agreement. Um, but so despite offering everything in an open shop and being you know, neutral as to what the clients want to pick, it is the off balance sheet that's getting the deals across the line. I've got it my cell phones now. Good, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah what footprint you have in the office space environment and how on the off balance sheet energy savings model you're you're thinking about the future of work and the fact that half the people that are more aren't actually utilizing the space and so the actual consumption if buildings designed well is going to be at a lower rate than historic modeling and how that affects the future and then, so, so that's, that's an interesting assumption that you just made. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because when we we guarantee savings, okay, so this is part of the financial decision. So we measure and verify, you know, using IPMVP every single year for our contracts. And we found that during COVID, the consumption was likely higher, okay, because people are ventilating more, okay, they want higher ventilation, they want, they want higher uh, changes of air per hour. And whether there's three people in the office or mm -hmm. 300, they have to maintain temperature. Right? Mm -hmm. So, although what you're saying you know, sounds like it should be reasonable, that's not reality. Interesting. Interesting. You know, like 5% higher is what we saw across our portfolio mm -hmm. consumption. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Really excited to hear about the innovations that you're making. And I was curious if you could drill down a little bit on the credit shocks that you discussed. And if your payments are completely covered by the savings, then what is the role of the credit analysis that you do? And in particular, how does that work? In with you're being asked to speak up. Well, speak, speak up. up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. <laughs> what is, who gets left out? 
through small and medium enterprises and affordable housing and kind of other uh, buildings that get marginalized. Not everyone is that you know global manufacturer with operations everywhere. So you know how does could the same direct credit bonds work in that kind of uh, low moderate income beneficiaries and, and emerging developers? How would you treat that with your credit bonds? So um, we are looking for clients that are at least cash flow neutral right? because we are going to improve that cash flow for the client. Why not? You know, our payments are being paid from savings that were guaranteed. So we've got a lot of retirement communities that banks just wouldn't lend to. But as long as they have been cash flow neutral for the last couple of years and they're not trending down, uh, we're fine with it. Until, you know, so far in the last nine years, since I've been offering this off balance sheet funding, uh, we have never had a client that we were not able to fund by somebody. So we, we do do those low income places and non for profits that are catering. We do community hospitals. We do that low, that low income in this book. And what we do is discount cash flows that are expected under the energy savings agreements, and we lend a percentage against the, the, uh, the essentially the borrowing base, if you will. That and that's yeah, providing the capital that Marcelo needs to continue to be doing what he's doing. Now, now that I have a private equity uh, majority on, as a, we're you know very concerned about, but what if all these little places, low income places, and pay their bills? Huh? What happens? And uh, COVID was an amazing test of that because we had as clients, retirement communities that were losing 20% of their occupancy you know, because they were hot heat, um, uh, community centers that uh, were shut down, hotels that were shut down. And we control those buildings. And when people came to us and said, hey, we might need to stop paying you, we would say, then we're going to shut down all your HVAC. <laughs> and they go, but the building is going to be ruined if there's no HVAC. Things are going to freeze and things are going to, you know, uh, grow more. They go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Okay. And even through COVID, we did not have any missed payments by anybody, even the places that were shut. So we can, you know, that was harsh, but. It allowed now my private equity fund to let me continue paying that to the market. Next question. Please, please speak up. Yes, hi. Hi, my name is uh, Rin Boon. I'm actually from Canada. Uh, I sit on the board of uh, an organization called the Efficiency One, mm -hmm. which is in Nova Scotia and the province uh, and the utilities put money into a fund, which is then administered by Efficiency One to do exactly what you're talking about, but without the same model. Mm -hmm. And we're now looking, we now have a climate investment side to on the urban side, mm -hmm. and we're trying to figure out how to take the next level to go into that green bank model. So mm -hmm. have you, uh, like in different jurisdictions, all obviously the laws and all of that, the mm -hmm. financial regulations are different. Have you any? any yeah, so I developed, so, you know, I developed this initially because I came from the Australian market. It was for IFRS. Okay. And, you know, now when I got here, so PricewaterhouseCoopers developed, you know, charges a fortune in Australia to develop IFRS. Then when we came to the US, they charge us a fortune again to develop it for GAP, and yeah. they changed nothing. <laughs> I paid six figures again, and nothing changed. So we we do it up on that part of our challenges. Maybe we can follow. Up. Yeah, we're gonna go to the uh, chat of the internet. Um, maybe this is a question about the opportunities presented by the Inflation Reduction Act. How can great banks? Uh, how the National Climate Bank help catalyze these kinds of companies mm -hmm. um, to ensure we can maximize um, that opportunity? Are you looking at the ROI opportunity for your business? Is it something which you don't need that capital anymore? Thank you. Don't? Thank you. No, I do. So the New York Bank has been absolutely amazing, but nobody's perfect. <laughs> 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 And, you know, they, um, they have a mandate to operate like a commercial bank. 
Now, what that meant is that a lot of opportunities were lost, you know, going to uh, in front of a CFO and the CFO would say, hey, Marcelo, your money's at six, six and a half percent. I can get it for four percent. And we go, yes, but I have this self balance sheet. And OK, does that mean you want to use your money to do an energy efficiency project? Oh, no, I can't because I have to put the money towards my other capital needs. And I've got more capital requests than I have money for. Okay, well, then we're going to be paying for savings, right? Oh, yeah, but the money's too expensive. <laughs> and those kinds of conversations that make zero sense. Okay, you'll be surprised at how many CFOs think like that and then do nothing. So I would have loved to see New York Green Bank with a different mandate that subsidizes that interest rate, at least, you know, for your own state where you are, you know, where, where you're trying to achieve big greenhouse gas emissions goals. And you know, that's not really up to the people in New York Green Bank, that's decided at a much higher level than them. So I'm not blaming anybody in New York Green Bank because they're all wonderful people. <laughs> um, but I needed to go, and now, you know, through these, you know, being part of a private equity firm, you know, and, uh, you know, being able, you know, we got money for 200 basis points less than what we had from New York, New York Green Bank. So now I can go to a CFO. The conversations I'm having today with CFOs is I can give the money at the same level that they can get it for from their own banks. And that catalyzes opportunities. All of a sudden, the J curve is like this because I no longer have that irrational conversations mm -hmm. with many CFOs that they go, oh, you know, that's about the same or a bit better than what my money I can get it up. You know? uh, I would love to see green banks do that because if we want to catalyze greenhouse gas emissions you can't operate like a you know you need to operate like the big banks you need if you want to operate like a commercial bank it needs to be at the level of the big banks at least you know for for smaller organizations like we were until recently uh, back in the roommate question from the room but some more questions here okay yes Yes. Hi, Mr. Fellows. I'm so pleased to hear how well this is going. Please, please speak up a little bit. Sorry. Original investment officer on this transaction many years ago at the Green Bank. Thank you. Um, I now the one that runs office with Department of Energy and is speaking frequently with the EPA about the new greenhouse gas production plan. So, what I'm really interested in hearing about from both of you all is kind of a combination of those prior questions. Where do you think the gaps are that are addressable without undermining recyclability of capital? Mm -hmm. So, um, one is you know cost of funding. I know that perhaps the green bank's cost of money is higher than some of these big banks that have the deposits, uh, you know, to draw from. Uh, so I don't know exactly how these twenty-seven million dollars uh, uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act is going to work, but I'm hoping that it can get you lower cost capital so that you can do what these big banks uh, are doing for us. I know that now just can't. <laughs> uh, the other piece that was very hard for us as we were drawing, as we wanted to, you know, Ecosave is building the largest geothermal project ever done in New York City today, including 30% you know, low income. Um, so geothermal has investment tax credits, solar, battery storage have investment tax credits, but because we don't have tens of millions of investment tax credits, it was very hard to carry that benefit to the client. Now, we own assets as a, you know, equal services agreement of balance sheet to the client, it's on our balance sheet. So we can monetize ITCs ourselves because so much depreciation already. So we have not been able to, you know, get enough of a pool of ITCs to then monetize it for the big ITC buyers. Now, hopefully that's gonna change. We've been able to transfer the ITCs. Um, I don't know exactly how the mechanism is gonna be, right? that's still uh, out there, but it would have been great if the Green Bank had been able to somehow pull ITCs to, from, all the lend, uh, from all their borrowers and being able to help us monetize that so that we can then do a deal for a client at a better financial return for the end user client so that more jobs are sold and more greenhouse gas emissions are reduced. Thank you. 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 Thank you
the board of brothers were continuing to look at the IRA and, uh, and, and we are looking at transactions uh, with that are comparing investment tax credit to the production tax credit and understanding the, the pros and cons of that. We've got two transactions we're looking at right now. I don't have the, I don't have the, uh, the new crystal ball at this point to the new house trap, I guess I should say, uh, yet as to what, what how we're going to address that, but we're working with two different issuers on that right now. Uh, and the reality is the market is figuring out, you know, exactly. You can still go back and do the traditional tax equity bridge against the ITC and the maker's appreciation. We've done that a number of times. We can continue to do that. The question is, is this new transferability of the production tax credit in particular, is that more favorable? But the market has not yet developed as to how that would be transferred, at what economics, under what circumstances, and who, who, who was out there to buy it. We, we know who the tax equity buyers are. The question is, are the, are the tax equity buyers going to be the same as the buyers of the production tax credit? I don't know. But hopefully, if they make it simple enough, it can be, you know, there'll be a, a much bigger market to transfer tax credits for these smaller projects. You know, because we spoke in, uh, you know, we had many discussions with wealthy individuals and with smaller companies that maybe just want to take one or two million of ITCs and don't need to take 10 million. And, um, it was just too complicated and too costly to set it up. So if they make it easy enough to transfer and simple enough, then it opens a whole new market of ITC uh, buyers that doesn't exist today. Could be, and we're, that's what we're, I'm hoping to know more about that in the next two to four weeks, but I uh, don't know it yet. I hope you call me, tell me all about it. Once you <laughs> Uh, Joe, thank you so much. Really enlightening discussion. Um, there are a couple more questions we'll save for the panel that follows. But um, wow, once again, very, very enlightening. Thank you. Um, moving to our next section of the panel now. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, now we'll move to our panel. My colleague, Dr. Saradani, Director of the Grain Finance, and we'll be moderating the panel. Thank you, Peter, the panelists. And if all y'all will just go ahead and come on up, we'll start talking. Um, as that gets settled, I'm delighted to dive into the exciting work of the Green Bank Network members here in the U.S., New York being one of them, uh, but also having a few others join us up here. We're luckily to have also had members in five continents at some point, and we're hoping to make it six, just to say this is our U.S. contingent. This is not all of the Green Bank Network. Uh, CBMG, at one point, I'm not sure if they ended up being able to come. They're from Brazil, a state-level bank. They're also hoping to be around today. But the Green Banks and Green Bank model are topics that many of us up here have been working on for a decade. With all plus, yeah, exactly. maybe not trying to age quite as much, but it's true. It's in the plus category. <laughs> uh, with all the interest coming out of the IRA related to this model and the topic, we wanted to hear from green bankers doing the actual work, what they do on the ground. So, with that, I want to not take a lot of time myself because I don't think you want to hear from me. I think you want to hear from the green bankers. But I will go ahead and introduce everyone on the stage and then let them take some remarks. And then we're going to make a lot of space for questions, including some of the ones that came um, over the internet while we were speaking before. So Sarah Davidson, Director of the New York Green Bank. Bert Hunter, the Vice Executive Vice President and CIO of the Connecticut Green Bank. Eli Hobson, CEO of the DC Green Bank. Jeff Deal, CEO and Executive Director of the Road Island Infrastructure Bank. I'm amazed you sat in the exact order I put all of your titles. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll hand it off starting with Sarah. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Thank you to you and RDC for organizing this. Thank you to the Capital Fund for hosting us. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, so I'm here on behalf of New York Green Bank. You just heard from Greg Randolph, head of our investment team. Um, we're a billion dollar clean energy investment fund uh, backed by the state of New York. And as you know, you really just heard, we focus on areas of the market where we see a lot of interest from other private sector capital providers, but not a ton of activity. Um, I think Marcelo explained it really nicely. You know, we, we try to um, focus on areas where 
um, you know, other lenders sort of, for whatever reason, aren't, aren't willing to do the brain damage for those that can only put, you know, $100 million to work with particular transactions. Or on the smaller side, um, they just don't have sort of a structured finance capabilities to, to really um, provide the type of financing that's needed for these deals. So anything that we're looking at um, has to meet a couple of basic criteria. We're looking at things that are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the state of New York, um, things that help drive market transformation. So we really want to understand if this is an economically and technically feasible transaction, why is New York Green Bank needed to help get this project finish line? Um, and then we have to cover our own costs. Um, we were designed to be self-sustaining. That sort of makes us unique within the, the New York state uh, landscape. Um, and yeah, I guess that's what I'll, I'll say for my overview. And apparently we could all speak up more for the folks on the time. We are not going to do what we hoped, so. Yeah, well, coming, coming from Connecticut, right, right next door, um, we were established. Uh, Speak louder. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we were we were established just before uh, just before New York uh, as the first state green bank uh, in the country. Um, we we actually occurred as a transition from a clean energy fund, which was established to do incentives uh, to promote uh, clean energy investment energy efficiency, solar, ground source, uh, heat pumps, and, and fuel cells, and new emerging technologies, and so forth. But the amount of leverage that was coming from that set of framework, which is $1 of public money and $1 of private capital. And uh, what was determined was we had uh, so many more higher goals to transform you know, our, our economy uh, to a clean energy platform uh, Connecticut perennially, as well as New York and many of the New England states, amongst the highest cost, energy cost states in the country. Uh, many reasons for that, but principally it's because the cost of electricity is determined by the cost of natural gas, and that's been increasing over time, except for a brief period, uh, just about the time when our Green Bank was established. So we had this, this real push to try to help promote investment in energy efficiency, clean energy, and we weren't going to reach that deep goal unless we were leveraging more private capital in. And that's where green banks like New York, Connecticut, and, and the others have, have come in and, and filled that role. Uh, we were established with a good amount of capital. We inherited uh, $75 million in the Clean Energy Fund. We're funded by uh, a system benefit charge, which means everybody who pays an electric bill in the state of Connecticut puts a little bit of money into the, into the fund. What we're able to do, which is uh, the theory behind uh, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which Senator Markey and Congresswoman Dingle described, is to take that money and then leverage it more with private capital. And we do that to the tune of seven or eight dollars to one, and we've uh, resulted in about $2.3 billion investment uh, over the last 10 years. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it there and turn it over to Eli. Thanks, Bert. Uh, I'm Eli Hobson, CEO of the DC Green Bank. Um, and thinking about how we started, I also have to say thank you to NRDC, but also thank you to Sarah, <laughs> who reminded me recently that early on uh, in the earlier position, she actually helped advocate for the DC Green Bank in 2015. Um, so we have been working on this for some time. Uh, but thank you, it's a great job, and I really appreciate all the work. <laughs> <laughs> so we are we are similarly funded by uh, the DC government, um, and so wanted to give folks a little perspective from the city scale, municipal scale, um, maybe one day state scale. Um, but we're still working on that. Um, <laughs> I was born at DC, so I, I <laughs> been fighting for state. Though. Can you be president? I don't know. <laughs> 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 I'm going to get all the I'm not allowed to talk about this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So sorry, getting, getting back on track, uh, we're funded by a system benefit charge and we have a second fund in DC that's uh, funded by alternative compliance payments when utilities and regulated entities cannot meet their solar carve out as part of our renewable portfolio security. We also have received support from the mayor from um, the stimulus funding and uh, focused on support for multifamily affordable housing. So grand total um, scale wise, we have commitments from DC for about 125 million um, we are now into our third year of uh, operations, 
and are on track to close around 30 million dollars this year. So really excited about the, the very rapid uh, growth in our deployment of the breach. And you know, as has been mentioned, and, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but really excited about the potential to continue that scale with the support from the federal government and the national region. Uh, so looking forward to continuing to grow that, and we see a lot of opportunity in DC. I, I think a couple of the items I want to get from the local perspective, um, you know, we see it as critically important to have local communities involved in the financing decisions that um, and so our board membership, which is nominated by the mayor, uh, confirmed by the council, brings that local expertise. And then we work with local developers really on a, uh, similar to the story that um, Marcel and Greg were telling, to support entrepreneurs who want to be in the green space, which is what we all want to happen, but may not have access to even small scale uh, local commercial lending because they don't have two years of audited financial statements. They haven't done a solar project that's $1 million before. And that's exactly what we're going to support. And so really excited to be working with our local developers and entrepreneurs to support those <laughs> projects and that growth and to bring new folks into the space. <laughs> and having that community support is great. In terms of what we see as the next steps, if and when uh, we see you know, the additional significant support coming out of the IRA, um, we have already, and many thanks to, to Bert and his team for leading the way on this, but we have a, a large facility with Cottage where we're supporting solar on uh, low income housing that is not tied to credit scores. So we're very excited about that access component. Um, we would happily expand that facility um, two to three times. Uh, assuming that we start to see significant support coming in. The, the model in DC works very well. We have a very valuable solar credit market. Um, so the projects between the increased uh, tax credits and rebates that we're going to be seeing in the IRA and the valuable solar credits, we can find it's 100% um, and start to provide. You know, right now we're providing zero cost electricity. With this additional support, we'd be looking to provide zero cost electricity and home efficiency credit. So seeing that next step uh, that's really supported by the support of the area for various. So I'll leave it there and look forward to questions. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Jeff Gill. I'm the CEO of Rhode Island Real Estate Bank. And Marcel, we'd love to see you come down 995 and do some business in Rhode Island. Sure. <laughs> you know, we're a little bit, the infrastructure bank is a little bit different than everybody up here. We've actually been around for over 30 years. We were set up as a quasi-state agency to manage uh, EPA funding for water infrastructure. And then that uh, <clears throat> we've always run a leverage model. In the 30 plus years, we've invested uh, well over $2 million versus uh, roughly $700 million worth of capital. Of course, it takes a while to, to ramp up that leverage. But um, in 2015-16, when the state was looking to uh, start to invest in clean energy projects. Uh, they looked around and thought, oh, Clean Water Finance Agency, maybe we should rename them and uh, give them some authorities. Those authorities were pretty limited. It was really a municipal clean energy program, uh, as well as other quasi states. Uh, it was commercial pace and residential pace. Now, Rhode Island is a small place, a small state in the country. Uh, I think our, uh, by roughly 1.2 million people. Um, we're four times the size of the city of New York, put it in perspective. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the numbers that we look at are often, you know, frankly, smaller. I think we're probably about the same size of DC, if not smaller. Um, but again, uh, our organization really is a, a centralized hub of infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> so in 2016, they added clean energy and brownfields. Uh, we had a transportation fund, we had water, in 2019, we added the resiliency. So we're investing not only in mitigation, but also in adaptation. This is the ocean state. Clearly, it's a very important flooding. Uh, severe weather events are extremely important for Rhode Island. So we're investing in both of those. <clears throat> and of course, for us, everything is, once we started in the uh, uh, resiliency space, um, we incorporate that into everything we do. So when we look at things from a credit perspective, municipalities, we're looking at what is the risk and exposure that our municipalities have? And in 2019, the governor tasked us with developing the resilient roading, or what the cameras on the roading, which was a resiliency strategy for the state. I don't plan because we 57 plans are sitting on the shelf. <laughs> but a strategy of the projects that were actionable to make the state more resilient. <clears throat> and we actually then developed a partnership with the Nature Conservancy, the uh, 
municipal resilience program. And we heard a lot, I think, earlier, you know, what's the biggest constraint? Everybody says money. But what we found both in the energy space and the resiliency space is okay, if you had the money, what would you do with it? It was a big, I don't know, but we don't have the money. So what we've tried to do on the both spaces is also deliver technical expertise to our municipalities or small businesses or homeowners around energy and also technical expertise and assistance to our municipalities around resiliency. And developing those projects because we found once we have the projects, we can find the money. We're much more competitive. Now we do get some money from the state and it's, uh, it's been growing and uh, you know, we're continuing to expand our authorities as well with the energy space like I said before, it was municipal or quasi public sector, it was pace to pace. So we're delivering private sector capital in our commercial pace. We don't have a residential pace program. Uh, we're not very comfortable with the lending practices of many of the uh, <clears throat> dedicated residential pace organizations in Rhode Island, small place, without any capital to run it. Right? You're basically asked to throw a party without knowing whether anybody's going to show up without any money to fund it. Um, but now our authorities were just expanded within the last fiscal year to include broader residential and commercial as well as public sector. We've gotten some money from ratepayer funds to help uh, kickstart that. And that's something that we're looking forward to turning out in the new thing. And then we look at it both, you know, I talked a little bit about this. It's not just about the environmental, it's about the economic aspects. So when we're talking to municipalities and uh, uh, small businesses and nonprofits, it is about developing tax flow positive transactions. And we have saved roughly $140 million in small businesses and municipalities in the last uh, five years, $140 million in reduced energy costs. And that's money that goes to the bottom line of our businesses, the bottom line of our nonprofits. It frankly enables uh, municipalities to deploy their taxpayer funds into other priorities. So that to make this really real and you started getting towards it, I would love if you could each describe a project, a program that you've done that really shows what green banks can do instead of the platitudes, what's something real you've been doing, ideally with a focus on um, low to moderate income and uh, marginalized communities. So let's go out of order. We'll start with Bart to mix them up. Okay. All right. Well, I think the, the transaction that comes to mind is, is lots of general. Um, we had uh, set up, when we started the Green Bay, uh, one of the first transactions we, we did was a solar fund. And that was because a lot of our contractors didn't have access to capital. Um, and and yeah, part of uh, what uh, was set by, by EcoSafe was about the access to tax equity and you know, small transactions and everything else. So we, we put together a tax equity fund with a uh, fund with uh, US Bank and everything else that did, did that. It was great. It, it, it sold out and, and so forth. But when we when we look back, we said, who did we really reach you know, with that fund? And we discovered that we were missing a whole big portion of, of the state of Connecticut, which was low, low to moderate income. Uh, some moderate income was getting getting counted, but usually it was above the average median income. So uh, we did an RFP, uh, positive answer, answered the call. And where the Green Bank came in, they said, well, we want to start in Connecticut, but we want to find our, our senior lender. And they said, well, we'll be your senior lender. We'll be your senior lender. We'll be your junior lender. We'll be your lender. <laughs> we want you to get started. So, uh, so they, they, the benefit of that was not only were we able to uh, incentivize them to come in and get started, uh, we said we would subordinate if, if necessary uh, to bring in uh, private, more private capital to expand their fund. Uh, by the way, they went from our, our initial five million, which we expanded, agreed to expand to ten. Now they've got a two hundred million dollar facility. Uh, yeah, with, within a period of, of five five years. So I mean, that's the scale and reaching impact. But it turned Connecticut from an imbalanced solar state to a to a uh, to a solar with justice state, meaning that low income is now getting solar at the same rate, actually a higher rate than, than above 
uh, average median income uh, levels. So that's that's the success that I think that we've been able to deliver, at least in terms of solar. And we're doing the same thing now in terms of battery storage because uh, we have a battery storage program. And uh, we connected Posigen with Generac, who's got battery storage, and Generac wanted to reach low-income populations. We said, we, we think we have to have some stakeholders <laughs> for you. Uh, and we said to Posigen, we will go to our board and get a facility to finance not only the working capital that you need, but also the takeout financing associated with it. So you just do the, the battery deployment with Generac. We'll take care of the capital side. If you need more, I'm sure we'll get be able to get uh, some more friendly banks to come along. So th this is a kind of activity that we could do, but it's it's important to realize, and I'll pass it over to to the others. But it's important to realize that it's not the it's not the money. It, it's not the money. It's being able to get it out the door, and it's it's working with partners like EcoSave, like Posigen. You know these companies that know that know the action on the ground, and they can get the money into projects and deliver the energy savings, deliver deliver uh, solar PV, deliver resilience. Uh, because the green banks can't do it just sitting there with a checkbook. Yeah. They need partners. So they need the right partners to know how to reach that mark. Very important stuff. So Eli, continue on. Thanks. So that, that was my first example. So there's several other pieces, but I think the, the one that I want to highlight for this group, I'm thinking about our opportunity to, to hit a scale. And so, you know, we have a significant amount of support from, uh, from the DC government that allows us to do some more scale projects. But in the city, uh, we see uh, you know, several large property owners, some of whom are nonprofits, some of them are municipal, some of whom are you know, large NGOs, where they're really looking at uh, two and three figure efficiency upgrades, deep retrofit, solar projects, et cetera. And so that's been a space that, uh, with our existing balance sheet, would be hard for us to, to play in. Uh, but we really see the opportunity to scale up there and accelerate uh, some large scale public side funding uh, with the support of the relevant. So some of those um, to directly tie to the LMI piece, you know, thinking about our uh, very large public housing uh, uh, opportunity in the district would be an example of ways we could hit that directly. Um, but also services from the DC government generally as a as a part of the DC government, we think reducing expense costs for the DC government helps reduce taxes, helps provide additional services. It's awesome. So uh, less concrete, but uh, I think when we think about the scale that uh, IRA support would help us with, that's one of the things that we look to. And Jeff, you were starting to talk about the resilience. I don't know if you want to keep on that or a different topic. Well, I think, you know, <clears throat> you know we, we try to re rethink infrastructure, especially green infrastructure. The, a lot of stormwater management projects and some of our more uh, disenfranchised communities that create green space. But on the energy side, this is what a lot of what we're talking about today. One of our earlier projects was a middle school in one of our most disadvantaged communities. And uh, it had a boiler that it had been installed in the 60s and it broke. So we had a school that was uh, really not operating very well. We worked with the city and the school district itself, which was always a challenge because. It's, if you generate savings in the school district and you finance it through the town, how do you get that you know, out of the budget? Is <clears throat> frankly in the uh, uh, Constitution of Rhode Island, you can't cut the budget through school district, um, even though you're generating that savings and financing it elsewhere. But we had to figure that uh, financially out. But so this was a school that we uh, we financed 100 percent of uh, you know replacing the boiler with a high efficient boiler, installing air conditioning, uh, you know, centralized. Uh, Controls, uh, high value uh, filters, low noise blowers, uh, you know, reducing the amount of work that needed to be done to set. And we didn't have that little lock thermostat in every room anymore. Uh, controls uh, automated, but uh, uh, frankly, it was it was a great upgrade for the school. It was a much more uh, comfortable environment for the students, the teachers. The students could hear the teachers, especially when uh, the heat was on. Uh, there was no air conditioning, I said, but more important, you know, perhaps even as important to creating a better environment within the school as we save the school district $150,000 reduced costs every year. That's money that can be redeployed into 
teachers, other infrastructure, uh, you know, and really helping to uh, now we make that school a much more comfortable environment, saving the school district significant money that can be redeployed into teaching kids. What's that? All right, bring it home. Um, so Jeff got very specific. I'm gonna get a little bit more high level because I think the best way to show the impact that we've had in New York Great Vegas really speak to um, the activity that we've had in the community solar market in New York. Um, so in 2015, when New York sort of launched its community solar policy, um, that included a very complex value stack um, sort of program, which included, you know, values of distributed energy resources. It was very confusing to the market. Um, you know, this required sort of um, not very well understood revenue models, sort of bespoke business models. And so, um, you know, I think other investors weren't really able to think about how you would value these projects, how you think about risk affiliated with these projects. And that's a great opportunity for New York Green Bank to step in and really like roll up our sleeves, you know, bringing the, the financing expertise as well as the regulatory and sort of technical component that we have as a division of NYSERDA, we were able to really draw on our colleagues and um, work the technical side there. And so that was released in 2015. Um, by 2017, New York Green Bank put out its first interconnection loan million dollar loan, um, you know, relatively small transaction for us, but, um, you know, that's months and months and months of sort of structuring and documentation. Um, and, and we think about building our products in a way that are replicable and scalable so that other lenders can start to do more of these. So the first one takes, you know, however many hours it takes. The second one's going to be a little bit less than that. Um, so that was 2015. By 2017, we had our first um, commercial lender co-invest alongside us in a $13 million uh, development loan to that was a uh, green back, backer capital that invested alongside us on um, this $13 million facility for Oya Solar. Um, and that was like a pretty significant milestone, you know, first commercial lender that also got active in the space. And then more recently, we saw CIT Bank um, take out a leading role in um, financing a New York focused, entirely New York based uh, community solar portfolio. You know, it's a top 50 US bank. And so I just think that sort of the, the work that New York Green Bank has done to really flatten the learning curve for other lenders um, sort of enables more private sector capital to be um, kind of comfortable lending in this space. And now, um, you know, community solar assets are really considered like a very valuable part of any sort of renewable investment portfolio. So, yeah. So you want to hear from the actual Green Bankers. They have so much wealth and knowledge on all this. So to go into and work, I want to get to the other group question, so I'll be a little bit shorter here. How uh, do you view IRA changing what you're doing going forward? Is it something where you are imagining different areas you're going to get into at scale? People have hinted at it, but just kind of a concise, not super short, but you know, not five minute long answer of what how that's changing your thinking. We'll start if everyone does want to answer. We'll start with Eli. Sure. Um, I think we're thinking about it as an opportunity to supercharge what our ordinary existing focus, but also to open up new areas. The um, one of the examples is we've been interested in getting into the electric vehicle uh, transportation space, um, and we haven't had uh, the bandwidth or the right opportunities. So the additional support uh, for scale, both for us to do the brain damage, which I think is really an important part of the Green Bank role, is to, to spend time doing that, uh, will help open up uh, that opportunity and looking at you know citywide what the opportunity is from the greenhouse gas perspective transportation support piece. So I really think it's it's allowing us to invest more time in some of those projects that we knew we needed to get to and we have to solve to um, address our climate challenge, but didn't have the uh, the bandwidth the first couple of years or the existing capital. Yeah I think from our side again it's you know what's been the biggest constraint to well for us early on was uh, the authorities we had, which were extremely limited. Uh, those authorities have been expanded, but didn't come to any money. They're a little bit, not much, no more than we had before. The risk of violating does. So, you know, let's talk about elections. There is a <laughs> referendum, uh, a green, bat, green bond uh, for the state of Rhode Island would give us more money for resiliency in a small business in Um <clears throat> That passes. But again, you know, we've had those expanded authorities, but we haven't been given the risk capital to, to take advantage of us. So we really see if this capital comes to us as risk capital, not just financing capital, then it will enable us to expand into other areas that we've now been looking for. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, kind of two ways that we're really thinking about the IRA. I mean, I think on, on the one hand, just from sort of a symbolic level, like it's hugely significant that there are hundreds of billions of dollars that are going to be deployed into the United States energy infrastructure and sort of infrastructure more broadly. Um, I think this is really meaningful to the rest of the world where we sort of had this, this inconsistent climate policy. Um, and these dollars are going to be deployed, you know, if we're doing this right relatively quickly. So hopefully you'll really see this like supercharged activity over the next few years. Um, and then on the other side, I mean, we're just really encouraged by the equity focus of this legislation. Um, New York Green Bank has had a, a series of public commitments that we've made to advance our, our um, disadvantaged communities work that includes a $250 million community decarbonization fund, um, $100 million for building decarbonization in disadvantaged communities, $150 million towards um, green affordable housing. And so we just think that all of this is going to be, you know, hopefully able to get done more quickly and, and hopefully bigger and better than we could have done without this funding. Right. I love, as with the others, I love the capital. I love the, the equity focus. I think uh, a few things I like even more, or equal, you know, it's like picking amongst your children, right? Um, <laughs> is the fact that it brings policy stability. I mean, we're facing ITC falling off, you know, going away when, at a time when we needed more investment. Right, not less. So this now puts us on a 10-year, you know, go full bore against this, this problem, trying to bring capital into the market, get more done. The transferability aspect of it, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, it is very powerful. The direct pay aspect, which then puts all of us here at, at the front uh, in the game of being able to marshal. Uh, you know, those tax credits, uh, particularly for public buildings and things of that sort. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's just, and there's just an array of credits and goodies and $369 billion uh, that's, that's throughout there that it's up to a lot of us, the number of us in the room, to do the translation of that into how uh, households and businesses can really take advantage of, of these policy measures. Uh, one thing that I'm particularly excited about that all of us up here are, are working on with you know, trying to put this, this climate uh, fund together, climate bank, climate funds, call it whatever you want, is it has the potential of being really almost like a GSE, meaning establishing for, for itself a rating, being able to use that powerful instrument to convey guarantees, undertakings, issue multiple billions of dollars in bonds, uh, credit enhancement for all of us if needed, uh, so that we can get more investment into this, this space. So it's all of that, all of what we're talking about here and more, and, and it's, it's just getting started. Yes, and I think that goes well into a question that relates to both the US and the rest of the world. Is there these different scales that we have the not quite a state, sort of a city, DC, <laughs> who knows where they are in there, up to a very large state, New York, and then Rhode Island and Connecticut, all not quite as large, interplaying with a federal Green Bay. So if you could each um, just mention something about where your scale and the scale matters for maybe positive and a challenge, I think that helps many people around the world because as we said, we have BMG that is a state of Brazil that is a member of the Green Bank Network as well, up to Australia, you know, not tiny country. Um, and these different scales all have some disadvantages and advantages. And I think it's an interesting thing if people around the world think about what they would like to do in Green Bank facilities. So we'll keep going down and start with Carol, well, again, you know, kind of our background has been, as I said before, you know, we started as an organization that uh, was leveraging federal capital in the long run research space. Doug knows the state of that as well. Um, yeah, we've, we've been able to leverage three to four times the capital we've gotten over time. And you know, so we do see that the beauty of that, and I think one of the ways that this funding can also be helpful for us, is that kind of federal nature of the United States. So we've got this overarching policy and, and guidance on the money, 
but every state has its own, every state and city has its own little nuances as to how best to, to uh, you know, the challenges that we have and how best to deploy that capital. And so, you know, we feel, feel that in Rhode Island, we're pretty well uh, positioned to take advantage of that and address the issues that we have, because while we have a lot of the common things across the states, and certainly in this panel here, there's also some differences. And our ability to take that money and then address what makes sense in Rhode Island, I think can be very powerful. And so, you know, we'll have to see how this all works out. But again, uh, you know, we have certain, you know, we've got a lot older, uh, uh, you know, building stock in Rhode Island, whether it's residential or commercial. I mean, certainly Arizona or Nevada, right? And uh, you know, so again, there's certain challenges that we have. Uh, in, you know, we don't produce a lot of electricity in Rhode Island. Right? So we're at the tail end, okay, it's not coal produced, but we're at the tail end, we're a taker of price. So everything that we can do from an efficiency point of view, I expect it to be a lot more offshore wind, which is uh, <clears throat> for the country and for some of the valley. But I do think that you know, the ability to take that money from a federal perspective and put it down into the communities, whether it's a city, city state like uh, DC <laughs> or Montgomery County, who's uh, you know another one of the green bags or at the state level, makes a lot of sense in terms of how we can get it out. To, you know, again, we don't have all the financial institutions in the state of the right, or many others. So partnering with financial, local financial institutions is a lot more uh, limited for us than it might be in other states. You know, credit and stuff like that. No, absolutely. I think it's a great point too that they're different local environments and you each get to focus on those because you know your community instead of someone far away deciding what we're out of So, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's um, a lot of the things that were just mentioned are sort of positive um, attributes and also challenges, right? We were hearing earlier, you know, the nice things of the world who obviously know the building stock in New York City probably better than anybody. Um, but when the developers that they're working with are trying to achieve greater scale, you know, they're limited in terms of the amount of capital that they can put to work. You know, you get to the state level and I think it's really meaningful that New York invested a billion dollars into New York Green Bank and that demonstrated to the market that this was sort of a real entity and that people should, you know, take it seriously. But again, we have constraints in terms of how far our dollars can go nationwide and we can sort of structure it in such a way so that we enable, you know, the borrowers that we work with to have some flexibility, but that can only go so far. Um, and so I think when you have a federal entity like this, you know, there's a ton of benefit to having one centralized entity that has capital raising capability that can put, you know, meaningful dollars to work that can achieve the kind of scale that's needed. And you can see that sort of filter down to the state green banks, hopefully to the local green banks. So it's sort of all part of one big ecosystem, which is really valuable. And um, yeah, I mean, we've been working on this for, for over a decade. And so I think that the opportunities here are really just like, you know, unfathomable at this point. Curtain. You know to add? Yeah, I wanted to come back to something I said a little earlier about you know that it's it's not not about the money um, it, that it's really about getting the money out on the ground. It is also and specifically the cost the cost of of, of money. Um, you know, we're, so many of us up here are, are just fortunate in being able to, you know, we inherited some capital from a predecessor organization. We get capital every every year, you know, so we're we're funded in a what I think all Green Bank, how all Green Bank should be funded, you know, you know on, a, on a regular basis. Uh, it gives us a lot of flexibility in being able to uh, tap the, the capital markets because we can approach those capital markets with confidence. Uh, and, and we have, we, we've done so with establishing the, the Green Liberty Bonds, which we've come to market uh, twice. The last one was oversubscribed four times over. We got $100 million of bids for $25 million worth of, worth of bonds. So there's a, clearly a market for this investment, but, but not everyone can, can do that. Nice, you know, just looking as a perfect example, we've got, you know, just tons of opportunity out there, but not enough well-priced capital to be able to, uh, to deploy against that market. Uh, inclusive prosperity, I see Carrie O'Neill in the back. Uh, you know, another case in point, you know, just tons of opportunity, not enough reasonably priced capital. And when I say reasonable, I mean three or three or even less percent 
Uh, but we've demonstrated that we can go to the capital markets yeah, as remakes. Uh, Jeff doesn't. Jeff doesn't uh, regularly. We, we do it regularly. Uh, in fact, we're doing it with, uh, I see Ron Salkstrasse sort of back there of Raise Green, where we have a regular note issuance program every three months where we're going to market uh, issuing basically one year CDs backed by uh, our investments in a, in a small business energy advantage program, which is small business loans for energy efficiency. Uh, and, and those this, we sold out the last time we came and we're coming up with another $250,000 of offering. It's small, but it's just you know, to demonstrate the concept. But what I want to emphasize here is the power of the secondary markets and being able to take what capital we have, replenish it, and deliver the opportunity across the board. Yeah, with with Hans, uh, with Franz's, uh, yeah, he has a brother named Hans, so I call him Hans or Franz. What what Franz's platform allows is for everyone to like invest as little as one hundred dollars into the clean energy economy, all, all up to our green liberty bonds, which are a thousand dollar entry price. But you have to keep your money tied up for longer. So this way, it's only for a year, and you get a part of this. But those secondary markets are so powerful because it gives access to more efficiently priced capital when you can pool these transactions. Uh, you know, we could take the eco save and we compare it with a butterfly transaction, which is uh, an ESA transaction that we've done for quick serve restaurants. So we could we could pool those together and. And I think my dream is for New York Green Bay, you know, DC, Rhode Island, ourselves to kind of pool some of our assets together and underwrite kind of jointly, you know, so a, in a pool concept uh, that would be very common. So it, it's, it's just thinking beyond our borders is what I think we need to do to really get the strength of our green banks to really deliver impact. And I'll, I'll just leave it there. That's, that's some of the things. That we're saying a little bit expand on that a bit. I think that's one of the things about the National Green Bank, but you also, right? I mean, as we do financing, we pull our transactions, we get what diversification we can in Long Rhode Island. But I think that's the, the, the potential beauty of the National Green Bank and the business model is taking transactions from all of the green banks, being able to create something that's much more diverse than any of us can create in our own state cities. Uh, and utilize that as a way to maximize financing and lower the cost of capital. So really creating more diversified while you're still addressing individual places, uh, enabling them to uh, create financing very attractive. Just real quick, yeah, I think both of those are really good points. Standardization is clearly a national green bank role, and so helping develop forms that local and state green banks can use, helping to provide support about you know, what has worked well in other places and might be available for you to develop in your city. So doing some of that knowledge sharing, uh, you know, potentially even up to you know, form contracts with service providers, those sorts of things. I think there's a really valuable role for the national up there that uh, as, we, as we're thinking about scale internationally. You know, one piece that we've seen locally that's sort of a, an analog in that, you know, we can't do we don't have the staff or the, the time to do some of the smaller transactions that we need to do to be able to help DC meet its climate goals. And so we partnered locally with CDFIs uh, and been very successful partnerships uh, where they can handle a much smaller transaction. Than we can. And we do a loan pool with a couple of our local CDFIs uh, where they can go out and see small businesses or community serving institutions like churches and uh, other houses of worship or nonprofit daycares. And so I think you see some of those same benefits there but if we have the power of, uh, you know, some form documentation and eventually a secondary market that we can roll up even those smallest loans to, I think it's really uh, to off. Absolutely. So I've got questions coming in online, but I would love to start with the room and see if anyone in here. Start with you. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Um, what kind of impact are you expecting the IRA to have in your cost of capital? Well, I would just say that we we depends on on how uh, the money is going to come to us. I think it's going to come in, in different tiers. Uh, some will be 
zero cost, long term, like uh, capital grants, if you will. Uh, others will be grants for technical assistance and so forth. Other will, others will be priced, you know, a, a couple of percent or whatever. But I think that what we would expect to do is to blend that together with some of our capital so that we could be more, more aggressive, uh, concessional, you know, where, where needed, particularly where it's, it's needed to get to certain you know, small business, multifamily, low income, uh, BIPOC communities, et cetera. And it'll have the most impact if it's deployed quickly and with you know as few restrictions as possible. Good. Go ahead, you. I'm curious about whether um, so you mentioned the challenges that you can bank New York Green Bank has limitations on its capital, whether you see potential for the New State Energy Financing Institution uh, partnership money for the loan programs office, which allows us to partner and uh, support projects without innovation um, that have support, which is either financing support or credit enhancement. If there's no dollar minimum yet defined uh, for what that support needs to look like. And as you may be aware, we are a multi hundred billion dollar federal bank that exists already that, like, that has cost of funds at treasuries. Um, with, we do price for risk as needed, but you know, it, it's really about the best deal you can get. We struggle with the challenge, as you noted, that we're 100 million plus scale, right? So we don't do well serving that in between. We need pooling, we need groups to work together, we need large deals, large transactions. Um, and so I'm curious about, about how we can best use this new authority um, to really accomplish something amazing together. Just in case people couldn't hear, it's a combination of DOE and Green Banks to summarize how can that work together. I think of a quick answer there. We actually just had a call with LPO um, last week. It's not like it could be like a lot of opportunity there. Um, I think, uh, I know uh, DOE is hosting a big event, I think in a few days in Philadelphia, I believe. So hopefully some more will come to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and then New York. But no, I mean, I think it's one of the areas that we'd love to like dive into more and maybe we could talk offline. But, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's going to be really helpful for our borrowers to have a lot of clarity on sort of which um, streams of capital they should be pursuing for sort of different components of their project. So, yeah. Um, I, I, we talked a lot about the examples, most of the examples that you gave were smaller smaller deals that are not yet standardized and driving the market to suggest how standardized or standard better developed product for especially two SMEs or households or interactions. But I think sort of two use cases on the near frontier. Sometimes I think you also do deals that are bigger. I think you can example interconnection financing where the security arrangements are complex and the near frontier for the private sector is not to do those deals yet. Um, can you talk a little bit about the trade-offs and experiences you've had in terms of your relevance on each of those frontiers? Doing bigger, complex, uh, bigger ticket size deals that you work out and pioneer versus sort of standardization where the standardization where the frontiers because the deal sizes are too small for the private sector yet. What do you want? Sure. Um, okay, well. I, we we love standardization. Uh, we we uh, yeah, one of the transactions I, I was mentioning with, uh, with the uh, crowdsourcing rate rate screen platform that we're using, uh, issuing our short term notes, the Small Business Energy Advantage Program, where where basically that that's a cookie cutter standard loan to small business uh, issued uh, through uh, the, the utility. And the utility has their contractors, and they basically just say zero percent financing, four to seven years, you know, to get your energy efficiency improvements done. And, and there you go. So we take those and tranche them, and uh, we we purchase those loans with uh, amalgamated bank. Edgar Romney, you grow? Oh, there you go. Right, right there. So Edgar and I buy the buy those. Uh, I think we're buying a, a, a tranche this week. Uh, and so we, we we do that, and then we we finance it through the race 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 platform. So we, we love that. As far as the the bigger trans transactions, uh, you know, to give you an example, we we like fuel cell financing, you know, doing the larger fuel cells. And we've got one going up uh, uh, again with the Malcolm Bank and a couple of others. 
uh, in, at the uh, New London uh, submarine base with the U.S. Navy is doing a, a microgrid there, and, and this fuel cell is going to be part of that. Uh, but what we're doing is we're providing subordinated debt into that transaction to enhance enhance the debt service coverage ratios. Uh, you know, the benefit there is we've got the confidence in the technology that's not universally shared amongst uh, lenders. Uh, but by being there and saying, you know, we'll take that that first that first loss or second loss behind the equity, uh, you know, we give a little bit of confidence in, in the market. Yeah, yes, those those transactions can be painful and take a, take a while, but you get to the point where you hopefully get the replication and you then you get the others to join in with you. Uh, so we don't mind being, you know, first in line to uh, to get it started and try it out. Others, and I think, in, and also with the prior question, I think the opportunity on the large projects is uh, is always easier to grasp, and so it's very helpful for PR. It's very helpful for our board members. It's very helpful for our bottom line. Um, we also have to do the small projects in order to hit our money commitments. But I think there's a real opportunity for green banks to take um, you know those risk tiers that the LPO can't. Um, and to help get those larger projects to the scale right. that starts to, uh, starts to move the needle on climate. And in a time from which this is time to leave, I don't, I know we all know this, but I feel like we've, in the federal government and in you know, our work as a quasi uh, independent uh, agency, the time value of money is not well understood and the time value for climate is not well understood. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're continually fighting against that piece. And so I think, uh, you know, the large deals help you move the needle very quickly. I mean, not that quickly, but so very quickly, relatively speaking. But you have to do the standardization. You have to go work to get these companies. Yeah, I, I mean, I think yeah, everybody wants to do standard deals, but I think that's a lot of what we're here for is to do non-standard the market won't do. Um, so talked about doing casinos, right? We've done uh, green, uh, <clears throat> green dry cleaners. Why does the market doesn't like the environmental risk of dry cleaners? But they still produce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, right? They still can use renewables. But I think, you know, whether it's a large transactions or small or segments that, uh, you know, uh, are more difficult, that's really what I think is pretty good Fill those market gaps, but also to a certain degree, try to, to deliver lower cost capital into more standardized transactions that get to leverage that and bring the private sector. But I think that's you know, we are here to take more risk, but we need that risk capital, which gets back to the the question. You know, if, if everything comes to us, you know, LPO all comes to us, the debt finance and will really help us on that. We don't have the, the risk equity capital. It costs us nothing. And it's very difficult for us to leverage and deliver that money better how low cost it is. It, it comes to us, it's a equity, it's a down return at home, and then it's our ability to take risk. So you know, I think the one thing about the infrastructure collection act, it's really going to be key for organizations like ourselves to get zero cost of this capital. Are there, yeah, <laughs> lots of decisions are going to be made in the near future. Well, I don't know if many people know, I am a former central banker, so I have to take this question that's coming in from the internet. How are green banks navigating the rising interest rate environment? What opportunities and risks are you seeing in current day? Yeah. I'll repeat it again. Uh, what do you, how are, is the higher interest rate affecting you? Opportunities, challenges, how are you moving forward? Well, we, we've got a transaction right now uh, with, with the CDFI that we're, we're financing. Uh, oddly enough, again, with the value. <laughs> you're, detecting, you're detecting a pattern here. Uh, um, but uh, some of the, the financing is, is linked to, to Prime. Prime is linked to the Fed funds rate. Uh, so several weeks ago, you know, seeing this, this trend that was unfolding, uh, we jointly approached uh, the CDFI and said, look, 
you know, we we need to see about changing things around and being a bit proactive in, in helping you, uh, you know, through this period of, of interest rate increase. And uh, so, the, so our green bank is going to step forward and uh, provide some uh, lower cost uh, fixed rate uh, capital uh, in, in there. And we'll see what amalgamated uh, can do. But it's, it's because that funding is being used uh, to deploy capital into uh, households uh, through our Smart E product, which, uh, thank you, Carrie, uh, and Inclusive <laughs> Prosperity manages for us. Uh, and, and IPC is taking that product national uh, today. So it's very important for us to have a healthy lender market. And so, yes, the impact of, of the increase in interest rate is some of our lenders are experiencing a cost of funds squeeze, which if we don't proactively try to find out ways to help them through that, you know, because let's, let's hope interest rates are not going to stay, you know, this high or higher for, for, forever. Uh, but through this period of time, help them navigate it so that we can keep affordable price loans to, to households and businesses, you know, during the stressful time. I think it's a great question. I think mean, we've wrestled with this, uh, you know, from the green bank perspective, we have to cover our admin expenses, which obviously don't necessarily adjust the interest rate. At the same time, our goal is to be uh, creating products that commercial banks can adopt. And so, uh, you know, the increasing interest rates gives us some more room to provide incentives. Um, and, and the concessionary comment that was made earlier, there's, there's more ca capacity for that, more space. But we also need to keep our eye on supporting our commercial bank partners. And we don't want to be creating products that are not going to have any value or possibility of uptake um, for the financial markets, because otherwise we, you know, we don't reach our climate goals, right? Our goal is to have all banks be green banks, and we can't do that if we're not um, being responsive to the interest rate part. Well, let me say two things. One, uh, tongue in cheek, our, uh, our private sector originate to distribute pace lenders. Rates are now coming in line with market rates. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. But the flip side is, uh, you know, coming into the winter in Rhode Island, cost of electricity is going to double. That will increase people's bills by 50% if you've got distribution and transmission. Right? The cost of electricity is, is pretty good to go. It's basically, we've been told SPUC draws a line with the, with the new an electric utility to stay. Well, not being used, but they're just buying the energy. Energy costs are going up 100%. So interest rates can go up, but you know, every dollar of electricity, you know, every kilowatt hour of electricity you're saving is putting a lot more dollars in your pocket. And much greater than the increase in interest rates is going on. Mm -hmm. So it's it's two part equation, especially on the efficiency side, that's going to enable us to continue to do that work that uh, uh, pays for itself. Yeah. Uh, so this one kind of into what some of you are hinting at, Eli. I think for states that don't have a green bank established yet, how do you see your efforts replicating across the country? Something we've been talking about for a long time. So. <laughs> I, yeah, I love that question. <laughs> a great opportunity to kind of mention it. Obviously, not every state uh, in the U.S. has a green bank, and not every state is likely to establish a green bank. And so a key role for the national entity is providing that support in mechanisms that are approachable for you know, homeowners in um, the middle of the country. States may not be fully on board. And so making sure that the national entity is finding local partners. I think it's going to be challenging for the national entity to finance that directly in most cases. Uh, possible exceptions for things like auto. So you know, it's, it's really clear you have to have local community partners. So figuring out is that uh, national CDFIs, is that local credit unions, is that local uh, uh, local banks on the commercial side, those partnerships are going to be critical and the National Green Bank has to be structured in a way that allows it to go out and seek those partners. That said, there's several uh, really exciting green bank efforts across the country, like our friends in Nevada and Texas that are getting stood up. The IRA is going to be transformational for them in a way that uh, you know we're excited about it, but it's really going to make their business model function. And so I think we're seeing a lot of those nascent entities that have been um, creating the structure in the organization to be ready for the support from the federal level that are now going to be able to take off. Uh, and if I 
sound like a broken record, I apologize, but as quickly as EPA is able to get the money out the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I really think there's an opportunity there for the existing efforts, but also for the national entity to reach into those places that are they never have. Yeah, I would just add that, um, you know, you tend to have the areas that have the highest emissions are the ones that are almost least likely to have a Green Bank-like entity. And so I think being able to actually deploy capital into those regions is going to be really important from a climate perspective. So, uh, you know, this group and others who have been working on sort of what a federal entity might look like. This has been like a really big area of focus is how you actually get those dollars out the door and who are the local partners. And so um, don't have any solutions yet, but I think it's been a big area of focus. And that ties in, you almost partially answered it. In terms of reaching low income and disadvantaged communities, what role could community development finance institutions or community banks or other local banks play in implementation of the National Green Bank? So I feel like this is sort of where we're all going that instead of necessarily maybe setting up a green bank in all places, because it might not be feasible, some places are doing it, which is wonderful, but also using those local community financial institutions of their different size sounds like a key part that everyone's saying. Absolutely. And I always push back when the question is sort of set up as an either or, because we really need all of Absolutely. the above. Uh, and we've had really just incredible success and love our CDFI partners in DC. And I expect that's true you know, across the board for green banks. And there's different roles and expertise that uh, the different entities can bring to you. So, uh, absolutely, there's a role, certainly in the statute for a reason. Uh, and the goal of the National Green Bank should be bringing in as much capital, not just the 20 billion and supporting the 7 billion that we'll all be looking to, to support. But that has to be uh, dramatically clever to, to get to the scale that we need to solve climate change. Absolutely agree. There is very little in the climate challenge that is either or. We need all of everyone and all of your work to be getting there. I think we have more time for one more question in the room, if anyone. Hi, uh, Dr. Kerry from RMI. I'm just to sort of follow on the previous question, I think it's really interesting to think about the way the inflation reduction act is written, in that, from what I understand, basically any NGO could be set up to apply for that, that funding it would be one way of, of operating. And green banks have always been geographically constrained. Would there be a scenario in which, you know, industry-specific green banks or green banks set up for a particular supply chain or whatever that might be, is that the type of model that we could imagine moving to? Or how innovative would this space get? How excited are you about that versus how sort of worried are you about a potential Wild West? So my... My theory, um, and I think the statement from your Congressman Dingle and, and Senator Markey, is that there is a benefit to having a national entity that can lever and can approach the capital markets and can impose some level of compensation. Um, so seeing the benefits to you know, some coordination, some standardization, a wide breadth of eventual products and uh, We'll, we'll all shout out to Carrie, but Carrie um, <laughs> and some others have been doing uh, leading a working group thinking about what are the financial products and what are the targets that a national green bank might offer. And so, having an entity looking across the full spectrum and saying, What are the opportunities? How do we best address them? Um, my view is that will lead to a larger body of support for you know, those of us who are actually deploying both green bank and city. Well, we are at four. Anyone? Everyone is? Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming. And I think this is a really useful conversation on how green banks themselves, as well as the green bank model, including with CDFI, the green banks, and other lenders, are really starting something that can get to scale and are essential. Because I think another theme is speed. We don't have time for climate. We don't have time for the money. We've got to have everything move fast. And these are key institutions in doing that. And also bringing in the private sector. There isn't enough public capital in all of the globe to do everything we need to do. And so your work is especially important in bringing those pieces together. It's not an either or, but it's a key pillar. So thank you to the Green Bank Network members for all you do here and uh, also remotely with us, as well as all of you for coming um, with your great questions and your uh, listening. And it's gonna take all of us to move this forward. So thank you everyone. <laughs>